So uh, today is a rough sermon day. Be preemptively warned. Uh, we are actually talking today about mourning. And I'm going to start off talking about mourning for the fact that we're going to have a second, or well, maybe a few seconds of silence for the loss of Mr. Tim Kent's beard. It's, yes. Uh, yeah, Tim has actually uh, joined the Barry swimming team, and uh, he needed the, uh, what do you call it, streamline this for his, for his swimming prowess. Ron is just like, oh my God, I can't believe this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so much fun, so much fun. Um, no, actually, in, in all reality, we are talking a little bit about mourning today. Uh, my, I started writing this message, I don't know, two weeks ago, I guess, and on my mom's Facebook feed, a memory popped up, and it was a picture of her father, who had passed away um, on March 14th of last year. His name was Douglas Graves. Uh, he was born December 22nd, 1938, to March 14th, 2021. Right in the middle of lockdown, so we didn't get to have a funeral or a memorial. Um, he was only allowed two visitors down in Belleville, so I let my, my mom and my sister go. We were lucky, I was lucky anyways, uh, right before COVID, Hope and I went away and we went to uh, Marmora, was it? I think it was Marmora where we stayed in the cabin. And uh, we got a chance to have, have lunch with him. It was the first time in a number of years because it's so far away and he doesn't drive and we're busy and, you know, pick a thing on the list of reasons why you don't get together and take, make the time. And that was, uh, the, yeah, that was the first time in a number of years that we got to see him. Uh, lots of times before that where opportunities were going to be there and we had to cancel, something came up or he canceled because he wasn't feeling well or what have you. He was 83 years old when he died. He had COPD. I remember when I was a kid, he, uh, he came and stayed with us. He was famous for rolling his own cigarettes. He could do it with one hand. Uh, it was pretty cool. I, I never smoked, never even tried it, not once. Uh, mainly because he would wake up in the morning and cough and hack for an hour, clearing his lungs out so that he, before he could start his day. And I was like, I don't want to experience that. That was not an enticing thing. Though I thought it was pretty cool. He would roll his own cigarettes. That was kind of neat. You know, as a kid, I was like, hey, that was kind of cool. He had one of those things. You ever seen, have you ever seen people roll cigarettes? They have like this cool thing that kind of like, like a uh, credit card thing that fills this. Yeah, it was, it was kind of neat. He would do it with his hand. It was like John Wayne. Right? He even had the haircut. It was awesome. He was so cool. Another cool story. Uh, when, uh, uh, when I was a kid, some of you know we moved into my childhood home, which is kind of cool, last fall. When I was a kid, we put a big addition on the back end of the, pro, uh, of the house, and he came up to help us. And, um, you, know, you know, back then, uh, the, the rules for doing your own electrical and stuff like that were a little bit different than they are today. So my dad installed the panel and ran all the electrical, had it all ready to go, everything was working perfect, and he went off to work. And while he was at work, my grandfather came in and was like, that's not how you wire a panel, and changed it all. So my dad, my dad that weekend came back. The first time, have you ever seen anybody get electrocuted? That was the first time I saw someone get electrocuted. That was pretty funny. I thought it was funny. My dad didn't think it was very funny. But my grandfather was a cool dude, man. I was like, you know, uh, unfortunately, he's not my, my blood grandfather. There's a whole, whole long story that I'm not going to get into about that whole thing. But um, I, always, I, always, I knew for a long time that he wasn't blood related. And I was like, man, that hair. Like, if I could have that hair. Could you imagine me with that hair? Oh, buddy. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah he, he stayed with us and uh, worked in our business for a couple years, uh, on and off. He'd come up and stay for six months. And I worked pretty hard as a kid. My parents had a concrete lawn ornaments business, like, uh, like bird baths and fountains, and believe it or not, real, actual, like, concrete garden gnomes. That was my first foray into beardness. Poor Tim. Sorry for you. Poor Rhonda. Oh. How, do you, how are you going to go on without the beard? 
I'm sorry. Anyways. Yeah, we worked really hard. So, like, you know, we'd get up in the morning and, and we'd start work during the summertime. We worked all summer in the family business, right? Lifting. That's why I got big guns. I'm a little bit chubby still, but big guns is lifting all concrete and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was fun. We did this cool thing. Like, uh, do, you remember, do you remember Windows 3.1? Do you remember that? Yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> Kids are like, What? They had a game on there. It was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. It was cool. 48 hard disks to install that. That was the legitness. You ever, uh, you know, somebody, they had this riveting game on there. It was cool. The first time I'd ever really had, like, like, a really cool video game that had color. It was solitaire. <laughs> yeah, that was rad. So we, we would sit and like, we had a little 13 inch TV sitting beside the, you know, black and white, right? Black and white. And we would watch like reruns of Star Trek. I was a big Star Trek fan back then. If Mike McBean's watching, he's like, oh yeah, me too. Right? I still am. I still am. I'm, I kind of geek out on Star Trek a little bit. I totally have pointy ears. I can't pull off the hair though. That's the problem. Poor Tim. Um... So it was solitaire, right? So like solitaire was a lot of fun. We'd sit for a couple hours and watch Star Trek and play solitaire and, and enjoy that time. That, that was great. Like, uh, you know, oh, I remember one day, this was, I, I, learned, uh, I learned table manners and etiquette, like dinner table manners and etiquette, right? Like, like uh, uh, you're not allowed to reach across the table, like, like you can't reach across. First time my grandfather I smacked back my hand. Don't reach across the table. My mom was mad. She was so mad that he did that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I remember that. That was, I learned that. I don't reach across the table anymore, ever. But, um, like, I've told you a lot already, and I could, go, I could go on for hours and hours and hours, because, to be honest with you, that was the most impactful grandparent that I had for a, lot, a long time in my, in my youth, right, before my parents split up. And then when my parents separated, it was a big mess. It was not uh, a amicable separation. And I kind of lost contact with him for a really long time because it was not, things were not good. Um, I had no contact for a couple of, for a number of years. And then, you know, we, we'd get together and we had the great weekend over at this, this he had a trailer up near, uh, up near Belleville. And we'd go stay to this campsite with this trailer, and we'd go up there for a whole weekend or whatever, and it's like, yeah, we're going to get together, and then something would happen, we wouldn't do it, and we'd lose contact again. We'd lose, lose the connection, and then uh, well, last year he died. I didn't get to say goodbye. Couldn't go into the hospital couldn't get him on the phone because he couldn't talk. He was hooked up to all these machines and stuff like that, trying to get through. And as I was researching this week's message, I realized that I didn't have closure. That I was, I was still mourning something. There, I, still had, I still had some issue here that was unresolved that I hadn't had a chance to figure out how to deal with. See, we... Um, to this day, like right now, even, closure isn't forthcoming. It's not here. I don't feel like that that's closure, right? We, we, need, we need closure. It's the reason why we have memorials and funerals and celebrations of life. It's uh, for our brains. Our brains need closure. Our, our, our bodies need closure, and, and our spirit, our soul, needs closure. And we need to mourn. We need the opportunity to mourn. We always, in our Western culture, we have some kind of funeral service or memorial or, like I said, a celebration life. And um, unfortunately for some of us, we've been to too many of them over the years. And often, often we don't do anything. I've noticed that lately people, especially because of COVID, we haven't done anything. Sometimes we've, we don't do anything because the person that died had asked beforehand that we don't do anything. I didn't want anything. Don't, don't make a big deal out of it. Just let me, let me go. Uh, or we don't know what to do. 
or it's too bloody expensive. So we don't do anything. I've even been to memorials. This is the one that I hate the most, right? Uh, I've been to memorials where everybody just kind of sits around in a room until 4 p.m. and then everybody leaves and nothing happens. You just sit there and talk. Nobody really, there's no schedule. There's no, there's no, you know, formal anything. There's just sitting there. And often those are the ones where people start fighting about stupid stuff, you know? So I'm, uh, I'm actually pretty decent at helping people through, through loss. Um, I've walked a lot of people through, through loss over the years, not just as a pastor of the church, but even beforehand, friends who have lost loved ones and stuff, and I've kind of been the guy that gets the phone call. But here's the funny part. I really suck at loss. Like often for me, because I'm that guy that's, you know, I've got to be the strong guy, you know. I've got to hold it together for everybody, right? My dad once told me, he said, you know, Roy, when, when my mother-in-law passed away, he said, Roy, you have a job. This is your job to hold the family together and to hold everybody up. You don't get to cry in front of anybody. And it's taken me years to realize that that was horrible advice. Because I just bottled it up for months and months and months and then <laughs> hit all at once. Hit all at once, and actually what, what really hit it for me, what really did it for me was we had this dog named Dana. If you've been around for long enough, you know about my bulldog Dana. She got sick and we had to put her down. That night, everything fell apart. Everything hit all at once. All of the other stuff hit all at once. Two o'clock in the morning, just sobbing. I don't, I don't process things the way that we're supposed to process things, right? The healthy way to process things. It all happens all in one great big lump sum moment. There are moments that hurt. There are moments that leave traumatic scars. There are moments that often need outside help and therapy to navigate. Often for me, I have to talk with somebody or work through something. Um, remember this clip from The Hobbit? where the dwarves are singing the song Misty Mountain. Uh, I, I, love, I love this thing. It's a, so the first time that, um, that I watched it, I was like, man, that's really powerful. And then I watched the whole series, and I was like, holy crap. That means even more. Like the second time around, now that I knew the trauma that these people, these, these, these people had experienced, let's, uh, let's throw that up and watch that for a second. Far over the the mountains cold to dungeons deep and caverns old we must away a break of day to find our love That's a song of mourning. That's a song of people I know is written and I know that they're acting and all of that stuff. That's, that's a song that people sing because they have nothing left and they just need to get it out. There's uh, other cultures that use music for an opportunity to mourn. Um, throughout New Orleans, New Orleans that's, a, that's a big one. If you've seen it, there's uh, on TV maybe or online, there's this thing they call, uh, it's a funerary ritual that they call the second line. Let's throw that up.
how they accidentally slide into another song and everybody's like, hey, that's really good. <laughs> There's two very clear different differences between the two ways of mourning, right? These, these people are using music to get the, the, the frustration and the the, the emotions out and it's fascinating because they will follow through the, the ninth ward or the fourth quarter they, they will follow the the um the casket down the road dozens of people all playing music and singing songs and dancing and waving flags it's absolutely fascinating and gorgeous it's a beautiful beautiful ex, uh, example of of how people can mourn See, uh, the Irish and the Italians, they have, they have similar ways of mourning as well. More, they have mourning beliefs that, you know, they, they fit well for me, right? The Italians on the left here, I've been to funerals that look like this, right? The, uh, the Irish on the right, those are the ones that I normally go to. Those are the ones I like going to. They're a lot of fun, right? Back in, back in the day, they would actually prop the body up, and one of the, one of the deals was uh, they had the thing filled up with ice, like all the way around to keep the body cool. Okay, and you would pour a drink, and you take a drink, and then you pour another one and pour it on the ground, <laughs> right? So you'd have a drink with, with your friend for the last time. They would stop the clocks, right, to recognize the time that that person died. The body would never be left alone. You know, they smoke tobacco, they drink together. This is a way to honor, to way to honor that person. The night that Patty Murphy died, right? Same thing. They actually, they would cover the mirrors. Wherever they were, they would cover mirrors so like the, the, the dead person wouldn't get stuck, his spirit wouldn't get stuck, or her spirit wouldn't get stuck. The Italians, they would actually post pictures throughout the town, kind of like, a, like, a, like a, almost a moving obituary. So you'd always, you'd always see and connect with the person in some way. There would be time for people to pay their respects and food would be available. You would share food around a table or just standing there, right? You can, you can, do you see how some of our, our westernized ways of doing mourning are kind of fitting along with some of these other things? They've all kind of flown in together. So my, my heritage is uh, Sicilian-Irish. I have a deep connection back with, with that culture. Um, but... On my dad's side, my great-grandmother was Ukrainian. Her last name was Maximenko. I've always connected with my Celtic roots but not, and my, and my uh, Italian roots, but not my Ukrainian roots. And I think it's the only real connection that I ever had is um, my great-grandfather, who was from Sicily. He came here from Sicily early in the 1900s. And my great-grandmother, uh, they would actually argue, but like, like scream, like it, imagine Joe Pesci, Right? And Betty White screaming and yelling at each other in the middle of the street. Okay? They didn't speak each other's language when they were mad. They, she would scream at him in Ukrainian, and he would scream at her in Italian. I had no idea what the hell was going on. Nobody had any idea what they were mad about. They'd just be screaming back and forth at each other. There's great stories about it. I hear all these crazy stories. Oh, her sister, my dad's Aunt Medi, she had her whole house rigged up like a haunted house. And whenever the people would come knocking for, like, a, you know, to sell something, they'd bring her in, and she would, like, have the whole house rigged up. Very, very funny lady. I've heard lots of stories. And she was a big drinker. So she'd get, like, oh, she'd be wrecked by 7 o'clock in the morning and mess with door-to-door -door salesmen. Right? That's a great hobby. <laughs> but the Italian, or I should say the Ukrainians right now, are, they're, they're dealing with a pretty... Pretty bad situation, right? Like, throw that up there for me. The next picture. Yeah, that's a people that, they know how to mourn right there. <laughs> Those are people that understand loss. So why, why does this matter, right? 
Why does all this morning stuff and sad crap that I'm talking about matter? We're, we're, we're in John, and we're with Mary and Martha, and Jesus is arriving. Lazarus is dead. Mary and Martha are mourning. The rest of the Jews are mourning. Last week, Nathan spoke about Jesus and, and Jesus being the resurrection and all of this, you know, rejoice, rejoy, and repent as a return, right? Resurrection is re-life. But in the meantime, Martha and Mary are sitting in loss. And, and I wonder, to be honest with you, I wonder if Jesus' response was actually overly helpful at that moment. You, like, picture this for a second. Martha and Mary are very, very upset. Uh, their lives are essentially over to some extent. Okay, it's, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes on now for, for these women who don't have their brother in the household. Big deal in Jewish law. Okay? Um, it's kind of like what Jesus' response is kind of like God works in mysterious ways. Thanks, pal, that's helpful. Got any more? Right? God has a plan. Sure he does. Of course he does. God has a plan. Not helpful right now. Thank you, though. Appreciate it. That's like when I, when I was in Pathways, uh, when I was in uh, uh, seminary school, somebody, they asked that question, how would you respond to somebody who had just lost a child? And somebody in the classroom was like, I would, I would put my hand on their shoulder and say, I'm so sorry for your loss. God works in mysterious ways. And I said, I piped up and I was like, and that's at the top of the list of things you never say, ever. Wildly not helpful. And I feel like maybe that's where Martha and Mary were at this moment. Well, Martha, anyways. Right? Okay, so we're, let's take a look and see what happens next in the story. Jesus is talking about all of the resurrection and stuff like that. Super helpful. It says, uh, After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. And when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him, went to Jesus. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, uh, noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. So all these Jews have now decided to follow Martha and Mary out to meet Jesus. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews had come along with her also weeping, she, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled and asked, where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, see how he loved them. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And Jesus wept. It's well known that this is the shortest verse in the Bible. Uh, I looked it up and went through a bunch of other translations, and it's pretty much all the same. It's all Jesus wept or Jesus cried. Or something like, you know, Jesus began to cry. Jesus saw Mary, and Jesus saw Martha, and Jesus saw the Jews, and they were all weeping, and they were all crying, and, and Jesus wept. So what? Jesus wept. It's, it's not a far stretch to assume that Jesus, who is going to die on the cross, it's not a far stretch to assume that he would be upset that the one he, whom Jesus loved has died. Of course he's going to be upset. That makes sense, right? It's also, it's not a far stretch to think, you know, you're standing in front of a bunch of people who are now crying. Uh, you're going to get some of that crying as well and be a little bit emotionally distraught. I would assume that would be a thing. But it's weird to me, why did, why did John decide to write that down? Why was that significant? Think about it for a second. We've been walking through John for a while. Why did John, at this moment, decide to say, Jesus wept? 
and tell us that Jesus cried. So I wonder, uh, I was talking with Nathan this week and he says, he says something along the lines, it's like, maybe it's like, well first, like, Jesus knows what he's gonna do. Jesus knows it's not the end of the story. He knows there's more to it. He knows he's bringing Lazarus back. He knows that's the plan, right? So why would he weep? Why would he cry? Why would he be upset? When he'd just be like, just wait, I'm gonna do something really cool for you guys and we're gonna bring him back. Just wait, I'm gonna bring him back. He could have done that, but no, instead he wept. And it makes me wonder, and Nathan mentioned this to me, he said, it's kind of like, you know, you're, you're a dad, right? And you have a kid, and your kid just broke its favorite toy, right? And the child is now crying because the, the world has now ended, right? Like, their world has now ended. Their toy, favorite toy is broken. I'm going to fix the toy, right? I'm going to take a minute, and I'm going to glue it back together or put a screw in it and fix it, right? I'm going to fix it. Don't worry, it's not the end of the world. But in the meantime, I'm still upset because I'm watching my child upset. Even though I know that it's not over, right? Even though I I know that I'm gonna fix it. But it wasn't fixed yet. Because Lazarus, the, the one who Jesus loved, has died. Jesus is uh, he's grieving and the fact that he died. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes along with this, you know, with Jesus. Why, 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 why did Jesus cry? Well, because he, had to, he knew he had to bring Lazarus back. Lazarus was, was in heaven with God, with the things the way that they're supposed to be, and Jesus had to rip him from that, and then he would have to die again, right, eventually. So there's that. That's weird. But in the meantime, Jesus wept. He's grieving. He's deeply moved in spirit. Jesus wept. And T. Wright says this, when Paul says he doesn't want us to grieve like people who have no hope, he, Paul, doesn't mean that he doesn't want us to grieve at all. He means that there are two sorts of grief. A hopeless grief and a hopeful grief. Hopeful grief is still grief. It can still be very, very bitter. Jesus, when speaking to Mary, talking about the resurrection, him being the resurrection, um, or sorry, Martha, I apologize, uh, he's trying to direct her to hope. He's saying that the story's not over yet. Okay, there is hope. It's okay. He's trying to direct her to that hope. And he's not trying to remove the grief. He's saying there's more. And Jesus wept with them. Jesus shared in Martha and Mary's grief and he sat with them in their grief. And he wept with them, but Jesus gave them hope. They grieved, they grieved a hopeless death. Their grief was hopeless. But through Jesus, we we find hope. A hopeful grief because we know the story isn't over. Does anybody know what the opposite of grief would be in the English language? Or potentially one of the possible options for the opposite? Any thoughts? Could be considered to be joy, yeah. That's what I have written down. Very good for you, Debbie. See, through Jesus we can have rejoy, rejoice. And eventually in this story, Mary, Martha, and the other Jews who were there and Jesus, and all the disciples, they rejoice in the return of Lazarus. That's a great part of the story. We're not going that far. Because today, Jesus wept. It's okay for us to grieve. It's okay that we're hurting. It's okay that we we mourn the losses over the last two years more than the loss of our loved ones, like my grandfather, um, over the loss of a business or a job. It's okay that we mourn over the way that things used to be because everything's changed. 
Heather and Nathan and the elders and I have spent many conversations and many hours talking about how things have changed and how things are new. It's okay to mourn those losses, but we, we need to grieve them with hope. See, I have hope. She's sitting right there. I'm married to her. It's like a long time inside joke, right? No offense to my wife, I, I have a greater hope. When Paul says he doesn't want us to grieve like people who have no hope, he doesn't mean that he doesn't want us to grieve at all. He means that there are two sorts of grief, a hopeless grief and a hopeful grief. Hopeful grief is still grief. It can still be very, very bitter. But grief with hope. This is a rough message today to write. Because it's hard to have that hope moving forward. I'm lucky that I get to say hope all the time in my house because it's just a reminder. Nathan's going to be very upset with me because now everybody's going to be like, hey, she's sitting in the back of the room. All the hope in the world. It's lovely. Grieving hope. She's mad at me. Okay, I'm going to get the worship team to come back up. Is there anything that you are grieving that I can pray for you for? I don't have online open. Has anybody got any? Is it open for anybody? Okay, McKenna has a friend whose mom was just diagnosed with cancer. Okay, well, we'll pray for that. And we have the opportunity for you to send in prayer requests online prayer at boxalliance.ca. Please do that. We would love to pray for you.